So let's talk about a few miscellaneous things, um, which are not less important, but probably easier to cover than what we have covered so far. You, you're in the position to train any any sort of, of problems you like right now, um, or at least to understand uh, the papers uh, which talk about certain specific problems uh, in this area. Now, I've mentioned it before, there are tricks or it often depends on how you train these networks more than on how you actually design the nitty-gritty details of your learning approach and one very important factor is how your training data looks like now you can go around and get some data collected say you want to build um, on a plant detector you take a lot of images from different plants and label them manually uh, still you will have probably a rich data set but you don't have every possible angle and every possible uh, variation of a tree a leaf a flower or something that that you want to classify but you want to teach the network to be robust against these changes right if you take a picture of that flower from a slightly different angle should still be the same flower. If you take a picture with a different camera, it should still be the same flower. So you can do something about this problem without taking billions and billions of images, which will still not cover your entire uh, or the options you have for taking images. And one of these very, actually it's a standard approach for, for training any sort of networks. One option you have to is to artificially extend your training data and that's usually done through input augmentation training data augmentation and and it means nothing else than you take what you have in training data and artificially inflate training size training data size through applying sort of expected transformations but artificial ones so you take say an image you rotate it a bit that's your new sample and every time you pick one of your training samples, you transform it slightly differently so that your network is becoming robust towards these changes. This is a very, very powerful approach. It's trivial to do, right? So for images, you have all these sort of image transformations for, um, for audio is probably a bit harder and for text, uh, but you have options to do very straightforward, very, very naive transformations to enrich your training data set and to get uh, a more robust network it is image augmentation input augmentation is really an excellent regularizer against the against overfitting to your actual training data your network will never see exactly the same input image uh, if you if you use augmentation here so there are a few neat implementations i personally prefer imorg which is just implements all sorts of transformations on tensors um, PyTorch has also a few this is very much restricted to 2d images uh, so both of them uh, I don't know too much about audio input augmentation uh, with text you have the entire internet so probably your training data is already rich enough for these sort of things but any other data where you can define simpler thin transformations however they look like in how many dimensions you need them uh, you can define and do image augmentation so samples for images for example is you can you can flip your image horizontally vertically you can scale your image differently you can rotate it you can change the intensity and the contrast of, of your image um, you can crop it or randomly pet it you can add noise at different levels you can do affine transformations um, you can do any perspective transformations again you should only use those which you expect in your actual test set. Uh, there is no no point doing very, very random perspective transformations if you will never observe these in a test set in the real world. So don't use all of them blindly. Really carefully select the transformations you would expect in a, in a real world case. Um, there is, there's one topic that interests me uh, in particular, which is you can also use these sort of representation learning approaches for anomaly detection. And the general idea in anomaly detection is that you don't have, say, a classification problem where you have labels for a lot of classes which you want to discriminate, but rather you have 
samples of only one class which represents some sort of normal class and then you want to pick out all of the examples that are highly unusual right they're different from what you have observed to this point so, so this is a hard problem there is no gold standard to actually how to do it there's lots of applications in, in finance and in other areas and uh, I focus on, on image anomaly detection uh, which is useful in various domains from surveillance to medical healthcare applications um, so there are various approaches in, in things like finance and so on and, and any kind of time series, 1D time series, you would probably train something that is able to regress to predict the continuation of the function. Right? So you have seen a lot of functions, you train some sort of autoencoder that uh, is able from a limited set of input uh, to, to continue this function. Um, so the second half of the of the course you'll also learn about rnns and these sort of things that are able to con do continuation so but the general idea is you continue and then if this prediction is too f too different from your extra obser observation you flag that as an outlier so it's an ill-bound problem you have to set some some thresholds when is an outlier an outlier your prediction will never be perfect so will, there will be also always an error but when do you declare this error as an outlier? So this, this is a hard problem. And, um, and you can, there are also different approaches, like you do encodings and then you do what we did before with the losses, you measure the distance in latent space and, and in fear from there, how far it is away from your core distribution. And again, you need to set some sort of um, uh, thresholds, biases, where you say, okay, th this point I declare this representation to be too far away, this is the, thus it's an outlier. Um, they're a bit more versatile than continuation prediction because, well, you can represent anything with, with uh, networks in a latent space. The only issue is how do you build that representation in the first place, and that's usually done through, again, autoencoder, self supervision, where you have. An input you want to reconstruct the output during training and then when you have a new input you're able to map that input onto this manifold you have already trained and there you investigate if it's within your expected margins uh, so this is also for images so you recon in images it's a bit easier probably so you can also go all the way and try to exploit the error of the network as an anomaly score so you have something like an autoencoder, you, put an, you take an input image, you try to reconstruct it. You've trained this autoencoder on all your normal data and now something unusual comes in. The theory would tell you that the network should have a very hard time to reproduce something it has never seen. So it will likely remove it from the image, which means if you then take the output, the reconstruction, and subtract it from the actual input, which has this anomaly, that anomaly should really light up because the network has never seen that before, so it might have removed it, and then and then got um, high error in this area. So it should tell you actually where it is. Unfortunately, again, uh, it's more like um, it's more problematic here because where do you declare is an outlier or not? Your network will always have some error reconstructing images, and you get a very noisy anomaly output and it's very heuristic to dis describe a kind of anomaly score for um, for, for this um, we, have, we have recently done something slightly different where we try to classify and, and regress artificial subtle variations this is more uh, in the direction of augmentations but where we carefully select what sort of anomalies we would expect so this kind of anomaly detection is also known as out of distribution detection is not unique to deep learning. Deep learning is just a powerful feature extractor to make the problem uh, feasible for approaches we have now. So low, it's basically used as a dimensionality reduction uh, for, for, for these sort of, of, of problems. So with deep networks, as I said, we exploit here that we can learn from lots of data from lots of data and and can build very very powerful representations feature rep representations that may be robo robust to noise and natural variations of the data and we can learn probably cross domain patterns to really define what 
normal or kind of abnormal means in a, in a, in a high dimensional space, right? In a dependency of features rather than having these features uh, directly defined. People use it, right? Finance people use it all the time, trying to find the right time to sell their stocks, which is, could be within an anomaly or buy. Google uses it for ads and, and things. So when um, Google invests a lot of time in these sort of uh, issues, when, it's, it's also in the direction of find out unknown patterns, new patterns, novelty discovery is this area also known as where, where we try to find something abnormal but probably more frequent. So we have probably discovered something new which we might want to classify as something um, particular as a category. Um, yeah, so, so people also tend to categorize them in unsupervised and supervised methods. The unsupervised have more or less covered, so you use an autoencoder, uh, reco reconstruction error, and use moving averages, dropout, or something uh, to set a time window for continuous input. So all of this is, is, is possible. Uh, supervised approaches, in this case you would, you would have learned an RNN, which you will hear about in later videos. And you probably learn a series of time steps and predict when an anomaly is about to occur. So you can also build this in as an um, as a fully supervised training class, where, where to task where you have uh, samples of anomalies, and then train directly on the time series when it's likely that an anomaly will actually occur. Uh, systems like this, in a more simplistic way, are definitely implemented in in a high stake. Uh, infrastructure, right? Uh, grid, power grid supply, and and uh, power stations, and so on, where where you don't want to have somebody sitting all the time looking at the chart, but probably a system that knows if the chart goes down like this, then it's very likely that we'll observe an anomaly in the next few hours. Um, okay, so I have one example, a case study, uh, which one of my students did. This is this is very interesting. So take yourself a um, minute and look into that image. This is a CT scan of a lung. So it's a, it's a, um, a plane like this through the body. And it shows the heart and it shows the lung. The dark areas are the lung. The bright thing in the middle is the heart. Uh, here, here we have the spine and, and this is all muscles and so on. And now people have, have done an experiment and tested a bunch of radiologists uh, for inintentional blindness because actually radiologists should look at these images and find the abnormality in this case here apparently there's a nodule could be a tumor or something natural you would need to do a biopsy to actually figure out um, and well in this experiment people put in strange things subtle changes into these images and ask the radiologists if they have recognized something weird so if you take a few seconds and look at this image probably you'll see something strange. If you haven't seen it yet, it's that gorilla. So if you're interested, I'll put a YouTube link here. Um, probably in the comments or I edit it and uh, uh, this is a presentation of, uh, of my student who introduces a different method which we call foreign patch interpolation which which aims to model these kind of subtle changes and has been recently quite successful in a you know people do this sort of challenges where they try to benchmark their algorithms against each other and this one was a really good algorithm it found almost all of these subtle changes uh, in, in that data set and, and if you're interested watch that video it's a very straightforward method <coughs> where you basically just take areas from other samples and interpolate them in your current sample and then you try to predict the interpolation factor which nicely leads into an anomaly score so if you're interested watch that but these are kind of side niches where deep learning is currently also very very helpful